Okay, welcome to Physic at Home. We're going to be covering the AQA specification on section 4.4, the nuclear atom. So over the next few sessions, we're going to do a session on the structure of the atom and the history of the discovery of the model of atomic structure that we use today. We're going to look at nuclear radiation and decay. We're going to look at nuclear equations, half-life, uses of radiation, fission and fusion, and a bit about contamination and risk. So we're going to cover that whole section of 4.4 and we're going to get the content across to make sure that you understand what you need to know but we're also going to look at it in terms of exam questions. What are the sort of exam questions that you might get asked for this and how do you answer them and what are the sort of common mistakes that people do. So the first thing I want you to do is I want you to start with a circle and draw me the structure of the atom. Let's imagine that it's an exam question and it's worth four marks. How might you get four marks for doing some work on the structure of the atom? How might that give you four marks? So have a go. Can you think of four things that they might be able to give you marks for? And you can stop this video now and take your time on it or you've already done it, I'm going to carry on. So here's the marks. Number one, we've got a central part. I'm going to do it a bit bigger just so you can, I can label the bits inside it clearly. The central part is called the nucleus. Please don't confuse that with the nucleus of a cell. This is physics and chemistry, so we're talking about the atom. The nucleus of a cell has got DNA in. The nucleus of an atom has no DNA. That's a really common mistake, believe it or not. I've drawn the nucleus quite big here. In fact, in a real atom, the nucleus is about the size of a marble in a football pitch. What else have we got? Inside the nucleus, we should have two sorts of particles, one labelled P and one labelled N. And I'm labelling them P and N inside the nucleus. But remember, for the exam, you, will not, you won't get away with just an N and a P there. The marks will be for labelling it proton and neutron. And the amount of times I've seen students who clearly know what they're doing and labelled an N and a P and get no marks because they've not actually written the word. So make sure you label them carefully. Mark, write down what they are. And then the last mark is on the outside for the electron. And that's that first question, and often it's the sort of first question, first part of a question on the nuclear atom. So it'll be something to do with, do you understand how they're arranged in there? And this comes across chemistry and physics, as I've said, so it's well worth knowing. And actually, if you don't know it, you're going to struggle with the next bit. So make sure you know that the neutron and the proton are in the nucleus in the middle, and the electron is round the outside. That's the first bit that we need to get in our heads for that. Where to now? From there we need to know the properties of these particles. So again it's a kind of could be a low mark question, could be one or two marks, very low demand question or it could be a little bit more complicated. Let's have a look at how that works out. So what do we mean by the properties? What they want you to know about the properties is the relative mass and the relative charge. And these words relative are telling us that it's not the actual mass or the actual charge, it's what that mass is or what that charge is in relation to the other particles. And we need to know what they are for our three particles, our proton, our neutron and our electron. So the relative mass of a proton is plus one or just one. One unit. The mass of a neutron is exactly the same and the actual mass of a neutron is exactly the same. It's about 6 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms so it's very very small 
and a neutron and a proton have about the same mass. An electron, relative to those guys, is much, 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 much smaller. It's about 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, so really, really tiny, um, with a really low mass. And we call the relative mass here zero because it's so small compared to the other two. Then the relative charge, what do we mean by charge? We mean whether something is positive or negative, plus or minus. And there's some easy tricks in terms of remembering what they are. The proton here is positive. The neutron here is neutral. And the electron here is negative. There's our negative in there, electron. So it's easy to remember those. Easy to remember that the proton starting with P is positive, the neutron it tells you is neutral, and the electron you can see in the middle of the E, we've got a big minus that tells us that it is negative. And I've written electron rather than negative there, so I'm now going to write negative after it. And I just wanted to show you where that E came from. So, how are they going to ask you that? They could leave this column out. They could give you the table, leave this column out, and get you to put those in. They could leave this column out and get you to put those in. They could leave rows out and get you to fill in those rows. They could also ask you in terms of a six mark question, describe the mass and the charge of these particles and where they are in the nucleus, which is quite an easy six mark question. You can see where those six marks could be made up. One, two, three, four, five, six. So you could get six marks just out of that bit of information. And it is really important that you get that information in your head, particularly this bit for the next one. Which ones are negative? which ones are positive and which ones are neutral, and the mass. The fact that the protons and the neutrons we say have mass, the electron, the mass is so small that it's almost insignificant compared to the other two. So that's what you need to know, and that's kind of the start of those questions on atomic structure. Do you know how those particles fit into the atom. Where are they? The proton and the neutron are in the nucleus, the electrons around the outside. And do you know what the relative mass and charge of those particles are? Really straightforward question, often the start of a longer question on nuclear physics or the nuclear atom. So where to next? What we're going to talk about next is a bit of history and the reason we're going to focus on this history is not only because you need to know an experiment but it shows you a bit of how science works and you know that there's a big component of how science works in this spec so we're going to look at what happens when we get ideas and we build a model and then we get new ideas and we do experiments and they give us different ideas and we change our model a little bit so we're going to start sort of cast our minds back. We won't, we don't know, even I don't, wasn't there, between at the beginning of the 1900s. So people didn't have electricity. Most people went round in horse and carts. There was a huge amount of poverty before the First World War. So it was a very different time than they were today. But it was a really exciting time in terms of physics. And it was at those, at those times that people like the, some of the really big ideas in physics were being put forward. People like Albert Einstein and the Curies were working on, you know, really, really forward thinking ideas for the time. And we're going to focus on how our ideas of the structure of the atom developed. So we're going to keep in your mind that we're going to talk about how we gained ideas, developed those ideas, tested them, got new ideas and changed our models. And that's what we're going to do today. So in 1897, a guy called J.J. Thompson discovered the electron. And he used his idea of the electron to come up with a model. So we've got our first model of the atom. So our first model of the atom was called the plum pudding model. 
and that was J. Day Thompson's and that was in about 1904. And what he said was that he said his negative particles or electrons were sitting in a pudding made of positive charge. So here's our electrons sitting in our positively charged pudding. I'm just trying to find the pink to give you some positive charges. So there's our positive charges in our pudding. And that was J.J. Thompson's first model of the atom we call the plum pudding model. And we had the negative electrons inside a positive pudding. Where do people get that wrong? Most people are happy when they come to the exam to remember the idea of the plum pudding model, but they get the pluses and the minuses round the wrong way. The plum pudding model has the minuses as the plums, the pluses as the pudding. So make sure you remember that when you come to the exam. So that's straightforward. So the plum pudding model of the atom was accepted for about 10 years until a guy called Ernest Rutherford came along. He was a New Zealander who worked in Manchester and he set two of his students, Geiger and Marsden, to work on testing the idea of the plum pudding model. Um, those students worked on this for at least a couple of years. It was long and tedious work. Often scientific research is long and tedious work and I'll show you why it was long and tedious now. So what Rutherford got Geiger and Marsden to do was he developed a chamber and around the outside of that chamber was a zinc sulphide screen that was coated in this zinc sulphide paint stuff. And the thing about zinc sulphide paint is when a particle hits it, it fluoresces, it gives off a flash of light. Okay, so we're gonna say it fluoresces when a particle hits it. Okay, so we know we're going to be doing something with particles here. Inside there they hung a piece of gold leaf. Now you've probably seen that gold leaf. It's the thinnest stuff that you can imagine and it's really, really easy to tear. And they hung up a piece of gold leaf in the middle of that chamber and they imagined it would be about one atom thick but actually it wasn't it was about 27,000 atoms thick in the end but at the time they thought it would probably be about one atom thick. What else did they have in there? They had an alpha particle source. Now we haven't talked much about, in fact we haven't talked at all about alpha particles yet but we will do um, in the future and I don't want to go too much into those at the moment but I want you to just remember that they are positive so they are positive particles they're little positive particles and that alpha particle source shot out positive particles and Geiger and Marsden had themselves a little microscope that they could move around the screen and they could look at where those particles ended up on that screen because they could see the flash of light. So here's our particle. Let's have one from down here. Particle hits down here and we get a little flash of light on the screen that the microscope can see. So that's because the screen is zinc sulphide. So over a long time, months and months and months, probably in, oh, into years, they moved this alpha particle source up and down here and they followed the line of those particles as they moved through the gold leaf and they were hoping that that would tell us something about what was inside this gold leaf what those those plum puddings what those atoms look like and their idea was that if it was a plum pudding model of the atom if they were going to support the plum pudding model of the atom it would be like firing bullets through tissue paper and those particles have just come straight through those plum puddings. So that was their idea. That's what they thought was going to happen. So let's see what actually did happen. And this is, I'm going to draw this as if it were an exam question, because one of the exam questions is, 
show or describe the observations for the alpha particle scattering experiment. So this is called the alpha particle scattering experiment. So here are all our alpha particles heading towards the gold leaf. What happened to them? Now there are three things that we've got to get into our heads. Number one is that most of those particles, so let's do most of them like this. Um, we'll do them randomly, they don't have to be evenly spread apart, but most of those particles went straight through. They carried on going through the, the gold leaf just as if, just as they expected, just like bullets being fired through tissue paper. So that observation kind of set them believing that the plum pudding model was right. However, they made some other observations that were unusual and they got them to thinking about what really was going on. And one of them was that a few of the particles were deflected. That means they were bent off their path. So there's those few particles being deflected. And the final observation they made of that was that one in 10,000 particles bounced straight back. Okay. And that diagram is important, okay? If you've got an exam question that asks you to show what happened or describe what happened to those alpha particles, this is a good way to start. So you need to have at least four or five lines going straight through. If you've only got one or you've only got two, it's not good enough. You've got to show that there's more particles going straight through than the others. Two being deflected. So I've got two pink ones here being deflected and then one bouncing straight back. And that gives you a lot of the marks for that. Inside this chamber, there was a vacuum. Let's think about why there might be a vacuum inside the chamber. Why might you need a vacuum in there if you are following the path of these particles? So take a minute to think what would happen if you had lots of air particles in there. And you probably already come, got the idea that if you had loads of air particles in there, you'd have got lots of deflections because those particles would have interacted or bounced off those air particles. So you'd have got all sorts of wiggly lines and you wouldn't have been able to see what happened. So it's important that there was a vacuum in there. So the first part of this is understanding what Geiger and Marsden did. So they had an alpha particle source, they fired it, it at a thin gold leaf and they picked up the path of those particles. There's only three real points there apart from to add the vacuum. So if somebody asks you, if you're asked what did Geiger and Marsden do, these are the things. They had an alpha particle source, they were fired at the thin gold leaf and let's write thin under there because that's an important marking point. And they picked up the particles and you can use the zinc sulfide screen, the little zinc sulfide if you want to, but it's probably enough just to say that they were able to see the particles with the microscope and then the vacuum. So if they ask you what they did, that's what you need. You need the experimental setup with the source, put the microscope on here and the gold leaf. Make sure you've got the vacuum. If they ask you what they observed, then you need the central bit. Remember, more lines going through, a couple of lines being deflected, and then one showing it bouncing back. There's all kinds of ways they can ask you questions on that. So we've done what they did. We've done what they observed. But we might need to be a bit more, give a bit more detail in terms of what they observed in order to get all the marks. So keep that diagram in your head with all those lines going straight through and a couple of them being deflected or bent out of their normal path and one of them going straight back. And let's think about how they might do this in an exam question. So how might they make it more difficult? What they might do is they could ask you to describe and remember I said a really good way to start that description is to use the diagram. 
or they might ask you if they want to go up to the seven, eight and nine type questions, they might ask you to explain what that told them about the atom. So let's have a look at what happened. What do you need to say for this? And again, I'll talk you through how this might be different sorts of questions in a second. So the first observation they made was that most particles went straight through. What did that tell them? It told them that most of the atom was empty space. And be careful to write space on there. For some reason, they like you to write space. It makes it seems obvious if you're going to write most of them are empty, it means empty space. But the amount of times I've seen questions where it's em empties on there and you can't give them up because it's got to be empty space. So make sure you've got space on there. The second observation that they found was that some particles were deflected. Let's put particles. Some particles were deflected. And what we mean by that is they didn't carry on their path, their straight path. So what did that tell them? It told them two things. It told them that there must be something causing them to deflect. So if you think of a particle moving along, yeah, straight through a system, if there's nothing in its way, it's not going to deflect. There must be something that causes those particles to deflect. Now, if you imagine if you come close to this bottle, if you've got a particle that's coming close to this bottle, what will happen is it might hit the side of it and glance off bash in and move out. So that's one thing. They thought that there must be something there for them to deflect. The other thing was that it seemed as if there might be some interaction between the positive charge of the particles and the nature of whatever was there. So here's our bit here that's causing our path to deflect. Now it might be that you actually bump into it and you deflect. But another way that they could you could explain that deflection was if we know that these alpha particles are positive, if that charge there was positive, that would cause a bit of repulsion and those alpha particles would then deflect. So that deflection from there, they said that there must be a small concentration of positive charge. It was small because not many particles were affected. If it was big, then we'd have loads of particles affected. And the final observation was that one in 10,000 bounced back. What did that tell them? Let's think about what might happen to cause a particle to bounce back. So if I've got a mass here, or and I throw a ball at that mass, if that ball hits that mass head on, what will happen to it is it will bounce back. Just as if you hit through your a ball at a wall, it would bounce straight back. So the fact that only a few of them were bouncing straight back seemed to suggest that there seemed to be some real concentrations of very, very dense material in there that was causing those particles to hit and then come straight back. So that observation told them that there was very small, very, very small, because there was only one in 10,000, very dense concentrations of mass. And those are important points for the alpha particle ex experiment. How could you get asked questions on it? You could get asked to explain one of these observations. You could get asked to describe 
all of the observations and for that again you can use your diagram but make sure that you are saying most went straight through and a very very few bounced back. I would use one in 10,000 bounced straight back. If they want to make it more difficult but fewer marks they might ask you to explain the fact that one of these things happened or explain the fact that two of these things happened and you can see already that there we've got six boxes here so it would lend itself really well to a six mark question where they're asking you to describe and explain what happened in alpha particles um, Rutherford's alpha particle scattering experiment so let's go through it again most of those particles went straight through, which made them think that most of the atom was empty space. Some of those particles were deflected, which made them think there must be a small concentration of positive charge. And one in 10,000 bounced straight back. So it said there must be a very, very, some areas of very, very small, very dense concentrations of mass. So that's what they explain. So let's go back through alpha the alpha particle scattering experiment again what are they going to ask you they could ask you to describe the experiment remember for the experiment you need to talk about the gold leaf you need to talk about the alpha source you need to talk about the microscope or the zinc scintillation and don't forget the vacuum so that's the experimental setup then you've got the observations most of them go straight through few deflected very, very few, one in 10,000 bounce back, and you can do that with a diagram or in words. But remember, if you're doing it in if you're doing it with a diagram, make sure you are careful about how many particles. Also, when you do the diagram, remember you need at least four lines, probably five for the ones that go straight through, two for the deflections, and one for the bouncing back. So be careful about the marking on that. Then, of course, you've got the high level describe and explain so what did that tell them about the structure of the atom and now we've got we start off with our plum pudding model of the atom so there's our pudding there's our plums in the pudding with all our positive charge everywhere we've now made we've now done an experiment so we're talking about how science works here. We've made observations. And those observations didn't really agree with this plum pudding model. It didn't say that there was small concentration of positive charge because it looked like there was loads of charge everywhere. It also didn't suggest that there was a very strong concentration of mass because these are little. Electrons are, are small. So it really didn't agree with the plum pudding model. So they had to come up with something new. So we did an experiment, we made observations, and we proposed a new model from our observations. And of course, our new model, you'll recognise as most of the atom being empty space. In the middle, we've got a concentration of positive charge. And remember, we've got our neutrons and our protons in there. And if you remember, protons are positive, so that's positive. There's our positive charge in the middle and we've got this huge amount of empty space and we know this is very dense. And so from these observations, we've now got our model of the atom. We know that most of the mass is in the middle. So we know in the middle we've got our protons and our neutrons. And we remember both of those have got a mass of one. So that's mass concentrated in the middle. Yep, here. Mass is concentrated in the middle. It's positive. We know that because we've got our protons in there. And we know that most of the atom here is empty space. We know that we've got these shells that have the electrons sitting in them, but most of the atom is empty space. And we always draw the nucleus quite big so that you can see, we can see what's in it. But remember I said to you before, it's about the size of a marble in Wembley Stadium. How big is an atom? You can probably get about 10 to the 13 on a pencil dot. If you sharpen your pencil really, really sharply and you put a dot on your page, you probably get about 10 to the 13 atoms on that pencil dot. So they are tiny. So what have we done so far? We've talked about the structure of the atom. We've talked about the fact that we've got protons and neutrons in the centre. 
and we've got electrons around the outside. Nice easy question. We've talked about the properties of those particles. We've said that protons and neutrons have a mass of one, or a relative mass of one, compared to electrons that have got a relative mass of zero. They're so small, they're insignificant when we're looking at protons and neutrons. We talked about the fact that protons had a positive charge, if you remember, P for positive charge. Remember that neutrons had a neutral charge, and it's there, all there in the word. And we remember that electrons had a negative charge. That's our structure of the atom. They're the particles in the atom. Then we did a little bit of history and we talked a little bit about J.J. Thompson and his idea of the plum pudding model of the atom and the fact that that took over from earlier models of the atom, way back from, from when the Greeks started talking about atoms. So J.J. Thompson proposed the plum pudding model of the atom in the early 1900s and it was this major experiment by Geiger and Marsden that really changed everything. And remember, Geiger and Marsden were the PhD students and it was Rutherford who was the, the boss in that situation. And it's always called Rutherford's Alpha Particle Scattering Experiment. It is the way it is when you're a PhD student. You get to do all the work, but you don't get the glory. You have to wait till you've 